This video was selected for a Best of Show Award at the 2024 American Academy of Ophthalmology Conference. A safe and effective strategy for managing retained subfoveal perfluorocarbon. The presence of retained subfoveal perfluorocarbon is a potential complication associated with vitreoretinal surgeries for the treatment of retinal detachment. This situation poses a challenge as both the presence of the heavy liquid and its treatment can result in permanent central scotoma. The optimal approach, timing, and surgical technique for the removal of perfluor remain to be determined. In this video, we present the case of a 32-year-old female volleyball player with worsening vision in her right eye, about one month after blunt ocular trauma with a ball. The patient had a history of high myopia in both eyes and amblyopia in the affected eye. Initial visual acuity was hand motion in the right eye, and fundoscopy showed total retinal detachment with a large inferior tear. The initial approach was scleral buckling, combined with PARS plan of vitrectomy, endolaser, and silicone oil implantation. The procedure successfully reattached the retina, however, in the early postoperative period, two subretinal perfluorocarbon bubbles were visible, one subfoveal, and the other in the inferior temporal parafoveal region. Visual acuity measured at this time was 2200. Microperimetry showed reduced sensitivity in the foveal region. A new surgery was indicated for the removal of the subfoveal perfluor four weeks after the first procedure. Various techniques have been described for this approach. In one of them, it is possible to induce macular retinal detachment by injecting BSS with a 38-gauge cannula. The purpose of this technique is to displace the perfluor bubble inferiorly with the injection of subretinal fluid. Following this, some surgeons place perfluor on the macula to push the perfluor to the periphery and perform a retinotomy near the vascular arcades to aspirate the bubble intraoperatively. Other surgeons prefer to simply perform a fluid air exchange and leave the patient in an elevated head position about 45 degrees in the early postoperative days. It allows the retina to reattach in the macular region and the subretinal perfluor bubble to be retained outside the central vision. In this case, it was decided to directly aspirate the perfluor bubble. The surgeon first removes the silicone oil. Next, brilliant blue dye is injected, and internal limiting membrane peeling is performed. Using a 38-gauge cannula, the surgeon gently touches the retina above the bubble located temporally to the fovea and performs active aspiration. Then, she carefully repeats the step in the foveal region, successfully aspirating the bubble through active aspiration. A smooth touch of the cannula in the bubble area, and a low vacuum setting for the aspiration, were sufficient to effectively aspirate the residual perfluorocarbon. The surgery is finalized with a fluid air exchange, and non-expansile concentration C3F8 gas is placed at the end of the surgery. In the follow-up, we present a favorable anatomical and functional outcome despite the presence of subretinal PFO for four weeks. On the fifth day post-surgery, OCT images show that the macular hole caused by the aspiration of perfluor was already closed. Postoperative visual acuity improved to 2060, with significant improvement also in the functional outcomes assessed by microperimetry. <laughs>